All right, friends. Well, um, we are, as you know, we have just gotten out of July, and we are now in August. And I tell you, when I got out of um, got out of my house this morning, I was just reminded of the fact that in July and August, have you noticed that there is like a, a very thick blanket of humidity that just just comes down on us, you know, here in Georgia. It's <laughs> just without failing. Every year, you know, it's here. I really like the way that somebody described it one time. They said it's, it's almost like when you come out of your house, it's like a wet squirrel just lands in your face. Just right there. Now, I heard somebody say that actually back in 1986 when I was in Nashville, and it is still stuck to this day. So uh, there's, there's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> yeah, the, the humidity is strong. All right, friends, well, we are now in a sermon series that we've been doing in Revelation. Now, last week we had a, a little bit of a departure, um, necessarily so, because it was kind of like Mission Sunday when we were celebrating all that God is doing in the country of Tanzania. It's really remarkable how you all are part of, honestly, just a miracle where God has, through, through this church, and through many of you all who have gone on the missions team or with the missions team over there to that country of Tanzania, how over the last, gosh, couple of decades, the, that um, through monies collected um, by you all through St. James, 18 churches have been built and gifted away to the Tanzania people. Isn't that awesome? It's just, just absolutely amazing. And already plans are underway for the 19th church to be built and then for a, a missions group to go over there next, um, next May and June. So maybe Jesus is calling you to be a part of that. So um, be on the lookout for that. But uh, So today we're going back into Revelation in this sermon series. So we, we tackled a couple of Sundays in a row. And uh, two weeks ago we talked about Ephesus how they're really a persevering church. And today we're going to be looking at Smyrna. Um, so I want to invite you to keep your Bibles open here to Revelation chapter 2. We'll be looking at verses 8 through 10. And uh, let's hear about what, what the Lord wants us to know um, because he does, have a, he does have a good word for you this morning in this message. And uh, I think it's really, really helpful. So Jesus says here, Look, let's look at verse 9. He's speaking to the people of Smyrna, to the church of Smyrna, of Smyrna. But he's also speaking, by the way, this is a word for you all here at St. James because God's word is timeless and it, it, it carries power that it does not lose through the centuries. And so these words are fresh and alive today. So Jesus said to them... Um, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, I know your afflictions and your poverty. Um, Smyrna, Smyrna was a very wealthy city. I kind of liken it in a way, almost like to what New York City is like. You know, the financial capital of the world in essence. And there's just such wealth in New York City, but yet there's also such deep poverty. Because within New York City, you also have Harlem, Right? So, I mean, just vast poverty, incredible wealth, all in the same hemisphere of, of a city. So, um, Smyrna was very, very wealthy, but the Christians who lived there in Smyrna were not very well off. And so Jesus is saying, listen, I know about the poverty that you all suffer from. Um, and so right here, as a matter of fact, that word for poverty... There are two words in the Greek language for poverty. The first one means basically that you have very, very little. The second word is the word that Jesus is speaking right here, uh, tokia, and it means literally nothing at all. You don't have two nickels to rub together. You're, you're just basically dirt poor. And Jesus said, I get it. And the reason they were was because the Christians were undergoing intense persecution in the city by, by people who were part of this very, very large um, Jewish population who lived in the city of Smyrna who were convinced that these Christians were, were worshiping a false messiah. 
because they didn't believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead and was resurrected and is now in heaven. They didn't believe that. So they thought that the Christians basically needed to just be exterminated. So they suffered a hit in the wallet, in the pocketbook. They suffered economically. They also suffered um, in the way that, that basically they were accused of things that they weren't part of. They said, Christians practice cannibalism because we come and we take communion recognizing the body and the blood of Christ. They were saying, ah, oh, they're, they're practicing cannibalism. Also, they were charged with atheism. Now, that's kind of strange, isn't it? They were worshiping the Creator, God, who made them. That's what we do here on Sunday morning. But yet, they were branded as atheists because they did not worship the idols that just polluted the city, that just filled the city. So they were deemed as atheists. They also um, were accused of having political disloyalty, being unfaithful to Caesar because they worshipped another king. So um, Jesus is saying, I know. I know your afflictions. They were suffering as well. They were being thrown in jail and they were being tortured there. I know your afflictions and your poverty. I know. Now what's interesting about this is, is that Jesus says that same phrase, I know where you are, I know what you're going through. He says it to every single church that he addresses in this letter. He says it to Ephesus, I know your deeds. Smyrna, I know your afflictions and poverty. Pergamum, I know where you live. Sardis, I know your deeds. Philadelphia, I know that you have little strength. I know, I know, I know. Jesus says the same thing to you all as a church. I know what you're going through right now. I know everything about you in real time. I know the lows you have felt last week. I also know your highs. I know your sorrows. I know your joys. I know the color of socks that you are wearing right now. Or if you're wearing any. I know the favorite flavor of your ice cream. I know the shampoo that you used this morning when you got in the shower. I know the color of the second bicycle that you ever rode. Jesus says to you, Derek, I know that you wear a hat that says, do good and be kind, and you live that out through your faith that you have in God. Jesus says, Amelia, I know how you worship me on Sunday morning as part of the praise band. And you're not just simply mouthing words. You are singing to me. I know it because I feel it. I know the pin number of, the, of your ATM machine. Don't let that scare you. He says, I know everything about you. Now, some of you all have, I don't know, the, the pedometers, whatever you, those things are that count steps. I know that there's also maybe some iPhones that are this way, and there are several of you who really love doing this. You know, it's kind of like a contest you keep with yourself. You're looking at how many steps you can get in in a day. Some days you're doing lousy. You're only getting like, you know, 1,500 steps in. Other days you're really feeling the juice, and you're getting close to eight or nine or 10,000 steps or even more. Well, you know what? Jesus says, I know that I saw the first step you took and I know how many steps you took all the way before you ever started counting steps. I know that. Now, you may wonder, Bill, how do you know that? Well, it's because his word doesn't lie. Job 31.4. Does God not see my every way and count my every step? There it is, Job 31, 4. And so he does in your life as well. And given all that God knows about you, God still loves you. And he really likes you. So when you know that in your heart you can go through any tough
tough stuff in life, though it doesn't always feel good, though it's hard and is trying on your soul, you can go through it because even if nobody else understands what you're experiencing with, what you're dealing with, my God knows. And that feeds you with encouragement. So Jesus says, I know. Now, next part. Let's look here at verse 10. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. So the word was, of course, to these Jewish Christians who, who lived there in Smyrna. And some of them, like I said, were put in jail. And they were, they were tortured to try to give up information about where other Christians were in the city. Um, and then also to get them to persuade them under the threat of pain um, to just basically turn against Jesus, turn away from him and start worshiping these idols and, and worship Caesar. Um, do, so he's telling them, now notice this, he's not saying every day is a Friday. He says, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. So, so God knows that suffering is a part of life. Now, I want you to hear this too. In light of what Jesus just said, it is not God's goal to make you happy every second of every minute you're alive. a newsflash to some of us but Jesus did not go to the cross to make you happy he went there to make you holy and that is so much better I'll explain why but did you know that this year it is estimated because this has been a continual pattern on average about 159,000 Christians die every year because they refuse to turn away from Jesus and because of their allegiance to him. We were shocked at 9-11 when 3,000 of our Americans, you know, our, our, our blood sisters, they died on 9-11. We were shocked. And yet this is 159,000 because they refuse to give up their allegiance to Christ. There was a, a bishop in actually in this city of Smyrna that we're talking about today. He lived around the 100s. His name, um, I, parents, I would not recommend, recommend you name your next child this, but his name was Polycarp. So maybe it was, a, it was like a Steve back in the day or something. I don't know. Maybe it was a popular name. But Polycarp. So he was a bishop there in Smyrna. And, and, um, and the political authorities and the Jewish people were coming against him. And so they captured him and they tried to get him to reverse his faith. To just give up on it. And so they said, okay, we're going to put you to the stake and we're going to burn you alive. You know, you can't imagine a more painful way to die. And Polycarp said something very interesting back in response when he had a way out at this point. He was 86 years old. And this is what Polycarp said. And I'm basically going to paraphrase him, but this gets right at what he said. He said, 86 years now I have served Jesus and he has not done me the least wrong. How can I possibly blaspheme him now? By turning away. In fact, he said, you don't even have to tie me to that stake. I'll stay right there. Burn alive is a love offering for Jesus. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. So again, God's aim is not your happiness, but your holiness. Now, you heard me say all that. Don't misunderstand me, please. <laughs> Jesus does not want you to live the most miserable life on earth. Now, that ought to make some of you exhale. It's like, okay, that makes me feel better, Bill. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, it's not his goal every day to see just how, how rotten he can make you feel, how miserable, and how much he can make you suffer. No, that's not it at all. In fact, it's just the reverse of that. Because God's desire for your life is to be joyful. 
So you can be happy about a brand new car you buy today, and then you can just be mad as all get out at your spouse tomorrow. And you're just in a sour mood all day long. See, happiness is a human emotion, and it comes and it goes. But joy, joy is a power, it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you as a believer. And joy is something, it's actually your inheritance that God wants to gift you and empower you to live out in your day-to-day existence. So especially when you're going through hard times, that there will just be this undercurrent of joy that carries you through. Because you know that Jesus knows what you're dealing with. Y'all, I saw something really remarkably beautiful about a month ago. I was in the home of one of our saints, our dear precious saints of St. James, who had a home going recently. So her body was riddled with cancer, and I was serving her communion to her and her spouse, and Brian was there with me. And at one point in serving communion, uh, Brian started playing this song, kind of soft praise music. And I saw her, and she's a lady of just such deep faith. I saw her, and she's been in the struggle against cancer. I saw her just kind of lean back in the sofa as we were singing. And at this point, she was only sleeping about, well, she was only awake about two hours of the day. So her end was drawing near. And as she was worshiping, I saw, oh my gosh, oh boy. I saw saw the glory of God on her face and I saw a smile come through. So even when she was suffering, there was joy given by God. That's God's will for your life because the scripture says from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So, you may wonder when you're feeling lousy, can I feel joy? Absolutely. Ask God. If you like it, ask God to give it to you. Now, look at the last sentence of verse 10. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you I will give you life as a victor's crown. Now, what this means, or actually what it says literally, uh, is it says Jesus is telling them, I will give you the crown of life. I will explain what that means. But first of all, um, be faithful. Be faithful. Hey, I've, I've got something good to share with you. Do you want to know how you can make Satan clinically depressed? Here's how. When, 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 when things aren't going your way, Stay faithful to Jesus. When other people are just simply retreating into a self-absorbed life and they're only living for themselves or they blame God for things that happen in their life that God has nothing to do with and they're turning away from God, you stay faithful. Never blame God. When you go through hard times and you keep standing in your faith, you're giving a defeat to Satan because you're in the process of walking over his neck at that point. In fact, as you do this, as he keeps trying to get you to turn from your faith again and again and again and giving you reasons to stop it, to give up on Jesus, when you keep staying faithful, listen, you're going to make him take a mental health month, not a day. And when he gets back from it, he's still going to feel miserable. <laughs> so keep staying faithful. And no matter how, many, how often life knocks you down, keep getting back up. Keep getting up, not in your power, because very often you're not going to have it. You're not going to have any strength to do so. That's the point of calling on Jesus. Um, Monday night football. Okay, some of you all are old enough. I'm not going to call you out by name. It's okay. You're safe. (laughs) But back in the days of Walter Payton, uh, they called him Sweetness. He was an amazingly gifted running back, and it really, it really was a thing of beauty to watch him run with the football. So it was a Monday night football game. It was the Chicago Bears versus the New York Giants. And one announcer, and this is toward the 
I guess, the sunset of Walter Payton's career, one announcer was commenting on the fact that Walter Payton had uh, gained over nine miles of yardage in the NFL. And the other announcer said, yeah, and that's with somebody knocking him down every 4.6 seconds. But he kept getting back up. If you want to know what that looks like, look at this man in the front row. His wife has been getting knocked down with cancer again and again and again. And when she goes down, he goes down because they're one in heart. Their love is that strong. But he keeps getting back up with the harmonica in his hand and to his lips. And he keeps getting back up in the power of the Holy Spirit to make music to Jesus. That's what it looks like. And so Jesus says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the victor's crown, the crown of life. Y'all, there's a lot of crowns in this world. I told you that Ephesus was known for having these Olympic games every couple of years in the city. They were, and so when, whenever anybody won an athletic contest that they had trained many months for, um, and they had beat all the other people who came from different cities to compete. Um, they were given, what did they get? Their prize was a wreath of celery. I know it's almost comical, but yet that was like a grand prize for them. So that was their crown. That was the crown that they wore of victory. Here's another crown that you're going to see. So you know that Prince Charles was recently installed as King Charles. Well, um, during this... I don't know how long it lasted, days and days of like this coronation ceremony. He received two big crowns, two major crowns that he wore. The first one was worth a few million dollars. This one weighed about, it weighs about two and a half pounds approximately. And, and this one is called the Imperial State Crown. It has about 2,900 diamonds Many of them are just virtually flawless, along with sapphires and emeralds and even a ruby up front. This thing, I know this just sounds crazy, but I've checked it again and again. That crown is estimated by, by jewel historians and experts, that is estimated to be worth about $5 billion. That's with a B, billion. Putting it in perspective, that's about two and a half times the cost of the Mercedes-Benz dome in Atlanta. Because Arthur Blank had to write a $2 billion check for that. $5 billion. One drop of Jesus' blood is worth a whole lot more than that. Hallelujah. Right? One drop. There are so many crowns that you all have worn in your life and others that you've yet to receive. Crowns of promotions, crowns of applause, crowns, even good crowns, crowns of children and grandchildren, crowns of achievement. But friends, none of them rivals the crown of glory that Jesus is going to place on your life. And isn't it remarkable... That the one who wore, and I like the way that Ed Love, who's an author of a book from, of Revelation, how he, how he frames this. He says, the one who wore a crown of glory, excuse me, the one who wore a crown of thorns is going to put a crown of glory on your head. And we think, that's not right. It should be the opposite. We ought to wear the crown of thorns. And we ought to be the ones to put the crown of glory on his head, because he's God. But yet, grace reverses the equation. It always does. 
in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God's kids said, Amen. 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 Will you pray with me, please? Almighty Jesus, you have gotten the attention of our hearts. Hold us, Jesus, because God, it's not enough to just simply carry an experience of meeting you here in this, in this space and carrying it home and getting through the week ahead. God, we have to give what we've been given. God, we must live changed lives. As a church, we must be and become a changed church so that it's no longer we used to but that we get to live in a whole different, brand new way with you, Jesus. As faithfully as these Christians did, Lord, back in Smyrna. So God, give us that power. Give us that raw determination. Give us that willpower, God, to live for you always and only through the power of the Holy Spirit, whom we love and treasure in Christ it is done Amen. So friends, we're going to just move right now and we're going to close with this, with blessed assurance. Jesus is mine, is what you're going to sing. So as we do this, I want to ask you to do something a little different today. I want you just to hold the hand of somebody that's next to you. And even if you cross the aisles, that's a good thing as well because Jesus died to make us a family. A family of believers. Because you're beautiful in his sight. So let's stand and sing. You'll see the words up here on the screen. Sing strong. You don't have to sing good. Just sing joyfully to the Lord. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Washing away. 